It is Friday, September 27th. Let's talk PlayStation. Welcome back, everyone, to another sold-out episode of LTPS. It's been, yet again, another very busy week. There's so much going on between PS5 Pro, the pre-order debacle, game details, state of play news, uh, also the Concord drama, which has more developments going on there. So a lot to go over. Let's begin, as always, with our PS Plus reminder. So your final warning here for the Essential lineup for September. Claim those games before they go away. This coming Tuesday, on the 1st, it's going to change over to WWE 2K24 PS PS4, PS5, Dead Space PS5, and Doki Doki Literature Club PS4, PS5 as well. All recently shown off during the most recent state of play, so we now know what these games are, and I think you all know where I generally stand on something like WWE. Yeah, it's a big game, but it's the kind of title where you probably buy that every year if you are into those kind of games, so... I'm not usually a fan of that, but I will say two out of three here is still very good, where Dead Space, it's a fantastic remake on PS5. Not only does it look just gorgeous, but it is really the the sort of pillar horror game from the PS3 cycle that uh, really does still hold up quite well for those sort of tight, uneasy combat scenarios that you can sometimes have with that game. A, a truly haunting experience still to this day. Uh, for Doki Doki, I know that's something where... <laughs> You know, if you're not into visual novels, I, I know it's an easy turnoff, but that's the one game where, and I think most folks know, it takes a very weird, interesting turn to where if that's not your kind of game and you probably would never buy it, you know, if it's here on Essential, I say claim it, try that game out. You might be very surprised to see just, you know, what that game is and what it ends up doing, obviously. So not to spoil it, but I think it's certainly worth uh, looking into. So uh, with that in mind, we did actually hear about a PS Plus Extra game that's already live on PSN. Uh, because it's in celebration of The Last of Us Day, and that is The Last of Us Part 1, so that is now live on PSN as well, uh, which it went in, you know, just yesterday for The Last of Us Day. We actually have more Last of Us news coming up later in the show, so we'll be talking about that, but uh, we also have the other news from the State of Play, which is some classic games going into premium. Not next month, it's not confirmed. They did say that it would be later this year, but it is Dino Crisis and... Um, Blood Omen Legacy of Kane as well. So uh, at least for Dino Crisis, that was leaked, oh God, like almost near the uh, relaunch with PS Plus in mid-2022. That showed up very soon, like either on Sony's site or like directly on the console, but it was a leak where we knew that game was coming. Very strange that it was missing for so long up until right now, but that game is finally coming as well. So that's very good to see. Now, another classic game news, we should also mention Siren, because this game was recently rated in Korea, which was a little weird, I guess, because the game is already on PSN globally through most storefronts, because the game was part of the original uh, PS2 on PS4 program back in 2016 to 18. So we do actually already have the first entry of Siren on PSN, playable on PlayStation 5, and I think that game is mostly you know fine on the console, because the clear issue here is that some of those PS2 games actually exhibit major graphical artifacts and issues when played on PS5 through backwards compatibility. They're not part of the new updated PS2 games from implicit conversions, um, but this uh, recent rating does show the, the basic PS2 description, so there's no actual indication of if it's, say, a, a modern remaster, maybe a proper port, maybe a full-blown remake, or if it is, let's say, updated emulation, because that's the one thing we were theorizing for a bit now that PS2 games are back from implicit conversions is that maybe they're going to go back and revisit some of these PS2 games that are problematic and simply get them on the updated emulator, make sure they have the save states, rewinds, video presets, and therefore you can also play Ape Escape or Okage Shadow King and have them not be an absolute mess, right? So I'm thinking that's maybe what this is, although this game is not available in Korea, so it could simply be some sort of uh, modern port or rather they're getting the existing game, you know, listed on that storefront and they're not actually doing anything with it. That's just speculation though. I think it could be a number of things, but I would hope that it actually is just simply updated emulation because that would mean they're also going to go back and clean up the existing problematic PS2 games that we got from the existing program. They'd now be native PS5 titles and get the updated features as well through implicit conversions, syrup emulation engine, but we'll see what ends up panning out. Okay, let's move on to the pre-order debacle controversy that happened yesterday for the PS5 Pro, but also the 30th anniversary collection because as we all kind of expected, it was not a great experience. We were very much going right back to the 2020 Q screen nightmares and that is basically what happened. Now, I will say right off the bat here, 
I don't know why they decided to put the collection and standard pro orders right up at the same time. Why would you not stagger that? That's issue number one, so that's a little bit weird. But the really surprising thing is actually the, the PS5 Pro Serialized Console Bundle, which was actually kind of affordable in the sense that we all thought like, oh my God, you're including the, the Pro, the DualSense Edge, the charging stand, all those extra goodies, like that thing's gonna be probably 1200 USD. Depending on where you are, it was a lot, but actually in the US, it was a decent savings of straight up, it was $1,000 to buy that console. So assuming you were going to be willing to give Sony a boatload of money, that actually was not a bad deal but that doesn't really help the scenario of the Q system and the problem there. So um, in my experience, what happened was around 8 a.m., that's when the Q started and uh, they said it was random and it pretty much was. I had three devices going, <coughs> excuse me, three devices going, three different uh, browser types uh, because that's the, the issue with this kind of thing, right, is that by the time people got in, you know, the, the site actually was quite stable by the time you did get in, but, you know, sometimes depending on the device in the browser, you can't add to cart, so you have to, like, refresh, and that's not working, obviously, and after 10 minutes, your session's gonna get, uh, you're gonna get kicked off, basically, and then you get put back into the queue, but it was random. I, at least in my experience, I had devices that, you know, the one that started to queue the first was the last one in and so, and I'm hearing that from others so it was still fairly random and it was a complete lottery in terms of if you were going to be able to get in in time to secure whatever you were looking to get you know ironically PS5 Pro at the time of filming the standard console still available to pre-order which indicates either not nearly enough demand or they are just manufacturing enough to meet demand which is always the big caveat there the 30th anniversary collection though so this was interesting. Now, it did not sell out in seconds. Some are saying seconds. That's not the truth. Uh, plenty of people were reporting that, you know, 10 minutes in, 15, I think up to 20 minutes in, the big $1,000 bundle was still available, which does indicate that they probably were not letting a whole lot of people in, you know, per session, basically. Um, and it's one per PSN account and everything, but of course people are gonna try and load up multiple devices, different PSN accounts and things like that. But uh, it, it did seem to stay in stock for a decent amount of time, but it's just pure lottery at that point. That sold out first. Um, then the standard console sold out after like an hour, I think it was. I, well, standard console is in the 30th anniversary PS5 Slim. Uh, then the Edge, the regular DualSense, then the Portal, they sold out in that succession, but they were available for much longer. So for me, I got an Edge. Uh, standard dual sense at a third party retailer because those listings also went up as well um the portal was available for quite a bit longer but yeah that was the uh the general experience it obviously sucks uh in some places the pro did sell out a lot faster like the standard pro not the 30th anniversary pro mileage is going to vary obviously in terms of allocation and, and what sony's you know manufacturing and things like that but it was you know not a great experience i will say even though it's not perfect, this is probably as good as it's going to get for now. I would like them to implement more changes that is kind of in the same veins of what they eventually did for PS5 early on, which was not just PSN accounts, but PSN accounts that actually have some kind of history to them. They, they never outlined exactly like what metrics they were looking at, but, you know, having some trophies on there, I'm not saying you have to yeah, uh, I guess paywall this behind people that have 50 something platinums, but having some trophy activity on there, some transactions, maybe the, the account's a year old or something, this would filter out a lot of people and the, you know, the scalpers and in bots and things like that. So there's a distinct possibility that you can, you know, have a better shot. But here's the other thing I want to outline, right? For a lot of folks that are upset with not being able to secure the um, serialized console. 12,300 units is not a lot, even though it may sound like more versus various other consoles that we've had, special limited edition consoles or something. That's still a very low number. If you're even part of that, you know, one or 2% of the entire install base that wants to buy that thing, that number, that 12,000 still represents such a small chunk. Like despite scalpers and bots, you are still fighting genuine buyers of the console. And that was very much the case back in 2020 as well. I know people like to yell right away at scalpers and bots. And yes, the consoles are up on eBay. Of course they are because that's how this always works. I don't know why this makes headlines. That always happens for any in-demand product. Yes, it's gonna go on eBay. They're gonna sell for three, four times more. Sold listings are going for that. That's just the reality we live in. I would be shocked if that didn't happen. But with that said, uh, <laughs> take them out of the equation. You are still fighting genuine customers. The real answer here would have simply been make more of them. 
which Sony did not do. I will say if you're a collector, if you're somebody that wants the console and you didn't get it, it's just, it's going to be expensive, but the console is not going to go anywhere as in collectors are going to sit on these things. They're going to stay sealed. You can look at the 20th anniversary edition and some people can typically, you know, if you find the right seller who's looking to offload it, you can probably buy it for around 13 to 1400 sealed. I mean, it's a boatload of money, obviously, and it sucks, but, um, these things are going to stay in circulation for quite a while and, and sit sealed. And so it really depends on what the, uh, that the market does to it for for the desirability but yeah they, they just need to make more and they need to improve the queue system it's not perfect but i mean it's it's one of those weird rock and a hard places where it's sort of as good as it's going to be for now but i would really like to see them make some genuine changes to also make sure that the playstation 6 buying experience is a lot better than what we just went through with the ps5 pro all right, let's move on to that recent state of play from this past Tuesday, which we were all expecting would be announced on Monday, which it did. And this was supposed to be Sony's, you know, semi-big show for September. Not a showcase, obviously, but as far as state of plays go, this one was fairly big and that it was over 30 minutes long. A lot of game announcements between third party, PSVR 2 stuff, of course, PlayStation Studios, which uh, we'll talk about that in a second here. But yeah, it was a fairly big state of play. Um, this is kind of what I was getting at before, which is like, I don't know, at a certain point, maybe we should not like hone in on the naming convention of these shows when, you know, state of plays can sometimes be just as good or even more exciting than let's say the 2023 showcase, which was obviously uh, seen by many as not a very good presentation, but I digress here. Uh, so let's cover up some of the finer details from, the, uh, from that state of play which uh, the one game of contention is Horizon Zero Dawn Remastered. So this game, while it was leaked you know, nearly two years ago now at this point, it is finally confirmed and we know a lot more about what this game is, what it looks like. A lot of what I've been saying that I thought this game would end up being is pretty much what ended up happening. So the one surprise is it is being primarily done by Nexus, not Gorilla, which does certainly add up with Gorilla's hierarchy in that they're very busy. They do already have multiple teams going on. So I would have been a bit surprised if Gorilla was also handling this one primarily as well, but it was in collaboration with Nexus. And uh, as far as what the game does look like, that's where a lot of what we were expecting did end up being true. It's over 10 hours of re-recorded conversations and mocap. So, you know, a lot of these sort of life the characters have an exhibit when you're talking with them and having those dialogue options in Forbidden West, that's now present in Zero Dawn. Uh, visual enhancements include reworked character lighting, improved hair shaders, improved skin tones, the updated volumetric voxel clouds are in there as well from Forbidden West, and uh, the PC version will include trophies and the PlayStation overlay menu, which they're not saying this, but that also probably means a required PSN login. But between PS5 and PC, there is a $10 upgrade path for existing owners because this is a remastered game. And this does also include those that claim the game via Sony's Play at Home initiative during COVID, which I was not expecting whatsoever. I, I almost thought for certain they were not going to allow that. Um, but they are not including anybody that did claim the game via PS Plus. So little caveat there, you would have had to rewrite your license on PSN and claim it through Play at Home to now be eligible. But um, they also confirmed that there will be a save file transfer from PS4. It's out October 31st with a standalone MSRP of $49.99 uh, USD, and there will also be a physical print proper on PS5 as well. Now, there is a bit of a catch-22 situation here, which is... I mean, first, it was very surprising that, yes, they are going to honor the Play at Home license. I really thought they were not going to do that. This is a company nowadays where they're not nearly as charitable as they used to be, uh, but I would love to be wrong about these scenarios. Sometimes they do surprise us, and they did here. That was good. However, <laughs> recently they also doubled the price of the PS4 version on PSN to where it was 20 for a very long time. You know, it's an old game, it's been given away, it's been on Plus, it's been on the collection, the Play Home Initiative, so it's always been cheap. Now it's doubled to $40 on PSN. So if you buy it today thinking you're going to get some kind of savings, you're actually not. You pay the $10 upgrade, then you're to the MSRP of what they're trying to charge for the remastered edition. So they're very much trying to close up that loophole that in theory would have been there because obviously for some, why would you not do that? Of course, if you have the disc, you can still do that, right? I mean, the game is very cheap physically and that's why I always advocate for physical media. Uh, but I will say too, that's already been reflected in prices as well. So you can check eBay sold listings and this is where it sucks, right? Because like sellers can be priv uh, privy to this info. 
if you look at sold listings from before the remaster and the announcement and all that jazz, it was like a $10 game. Now it's like inching to 15 or 20 bucks, but it's still cheaper, obviously, if you want to go that route and you don't care about like a PS5 banner on your box art or anything, if you don't want to get the physical PS5 print. Um, but either way, this is something where Sony is uh, trying to close it up, like kind of in the same manner we saw with... Uh, uh, PS Now back in the day where right before the relaunch they obviously were not going to let people continue to subscribe for a year then get grandfathered into the 120 a year plan at $60 right so that it's like we understand why they did it but it's just not a good look when the headlines go out um, in the case of say The Last of Us Part 2 that game technically was always 40 for a long time on PSN which means the there wasn't really a price savings if you bought the game like very recently up until the part two remaster um the game did go on sale very often to like 20 or sometimes 10 but like generally it was 40 where zero dawn was 20 for a very long time up until the remaster so that's more of the sony that i thought would have maybe not honored the play at home license but i think this is still generally a net positive in that you can still buy a cheaper disc or use your license, which a lot of people did claim it that way. Um, now, I will also mention this. It's cool that Nixus is doing this port because uh, Nixus has been so far primarily doing the PC stuff as well. So it's you know good to see them uh, be able to offload some of these uh, extra projects and also do some native PS5 versions as well, which uh, as far as the remaster goes, this game actually is doing, I think, a lot versus what we saw with other remasters. So um it's really not a bad deal if you are looking to jump back into the game for just a $10 upgrade path. Now, of course, the big show closing announcement from the State of Play is Sucker Punch finally confirming their next game, which is Ghost of Yote on PlayStation 5 coming next year in 2025. And we have some additional details cleared up on the PlayStation blog and also a separate New York Times article as well. So over on the PS blog, Sucker Punch did talk about how they wanted to explore the idea of the ghost with a new origin story and a protagonist. So her name is Atsu, and the story takes place in 1603, 300 years after the events of Tsushima. It's set in the land surrounding Mount Yote in northern Japan, which in the present day is known as Hokkaido. The only real description that we have of the story itself so far is that it is about underdog vengeance and that players will have more control over her story than in the previous game. We're also hearing that for gameplay, there will be the option to master firearms as well as melee weapons like the katana. And that's really all they're saying about that for now, but Sucker Punch did say that this is the first game built from the ground up on PlayStation 5, building a new visual foundation that they established with Tsushima, and they do say they've achieved massive sight lines, new skies featuring twinkling stars and auroras, and even more believable movement from the wind on grass and the vegetation, and there's more improvements that they'll share in the future which we already have separate word here from the New York Times piece that Sucker Punch did take two research trips to northern Japan, and it was that mountain, the lake, the beautiful park, the ambiance. That's when they realized they wanted to bring that into the game. Um, you know, sitting on the trailer for a little bit, it looks gorgeous, obviously, and uh, I, I think that's the, the greater conversation to have is that they're taking this direction of it's a ghost of blank game and they're going to play around with, you know, timelines and characters and things. And it's more about the notoriety of the name, which is the ghost of location. And I what I find very noteworthy here is them saying that you're going to have more agency in her story versus Jen. Now, the thing is, I, I really liked Jen's story a lot. I actually would have loved to see more Jen Sakai. Uh, but with that story, and for those that played the game, you know that going through it, the game has this sort of appearance that when it comes to combat scenarios, you can go about it in the way of the samurai and just take everything head on, or you can be the ghost and be a little bit more stealthy and kind of go against your code of conduct. And uh, that plays a, a pretty big role in how the story plays out. But, you know, it gets to a point where there's just not much agency in the decisions that you ended up making throughout the entirety of the game. So I would hope that actually is better reflected with Atsu's story and how she has this underdog vengeance story. That is the idea of the ghost, I think, is this, you know, person that's going to go against the grim society or what people expect of her. So I... I I'm completely on board with exactly what they're trying to, I, I guess, do here, which is focus on this, this, this legend. And I think everyone's sort of expecting like this game is absolutely going to have some little moment where the ghost of Tsushima is referenced and he's of legend. And I, I just, I think that's so cool. So I, I'm all for that. Um, but we can talk about what we learned from the New York Times piece, which is 
this is certainly a franchise Sony is going to want to explore and make bigger. I mean, this really is Sucker Punch's only second entry. We do know there's a movie already coming, but we are hearing that, uh, well, from the writer Zachary Small, he does note that the beginning of this uh, franchise is going to include at least one movie, which is the confirmed Chad Stahelski direction, uh, but also other spinoffs as well. Um, and that's something that's more emblematic of what we're seeing with, you know, God of War and Horizon Zero Dawn. So we might see a lot more more ghost of stories, which if that's how they're planning on fleshing out the anthology and doing separate characters and things, I, 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 I'm I, for it. I think there's a lot of upside in exploring this. And as long as you you treat the, well, I say source material, but since every character is going to be new, you can, you can kind of go about this in your own direction and every character can have their own path and their own story, obviously. But I just hope that the sort of key principles of, you know, what Tsushima was is really baked into every sort of extra game or a spinoff, whatever they want to do transmedia wise. But, um, so far Yote, I think looks very exciting. I'm just, I'm quite pleased that not only did we get this game announced during the state of play, which I mean, that, that to me was like the bare minimum. It would have been, as I say, a very poor optics thing if they come out with the state of play with the PS5 pro pricing and everything that's transpired as of late. And they just talk about, you know, Lego horizon and the remaster. And, you know, it just would have been a very tough look to not finally come out with at least one first party team and show off something. Sucker Punch was lined up to be the, the next studio to finally say something. And it's now it's cool that we have a, a like a faster turnaround. You know, we're already so close to 2025. So even if this game is, let's say, late 2025, we're only looking at, you know, about a year until the game eventually comes out. So that's uh, really good. And I cannot wait to see what, what Sucker Punch is cooking up with this game because Tsushima is, I it, it climbed the ladder for me very quick as far as like some of the more recent PlayStation Studio games and how much I really enjoyed that title. So I am all for what Ghost of Yote is going to end up looking like. Now, one very surprising announcement out of that state of play was Pal World now being available on PlayStation 5. So a shadow drop immediately, $30 on PSN. You can buy it, play it, finally enjoy what's going on with that. You know, very weird Pokemon sort of gun style game. The news here obviously is that it was a, a bit strange given that we thought like Pocket Pair is in some hot water because they're now being sued by Nintendo. Um, and that's a, that lawsuit's over patent infringement, not copyright. And even Pocket Pair themselves still don't exactly know what they're you know, being accused of here. But the point is uh, we now know how they're handling this, which is the game did launch, but not in Japan. So at least in that market, that's where they're trying to, I guess, be agreeable for the time being until they, they work through this entire lawsuit, which is going to be a really interesting thing to see play out. I just thought we'd at least mention that there actually were some repercussions there, uh, but for the time being, they're still full steam ahead. I mean, the shadow drop was clearly planned from the, the very onset, so that's why they didn't take it out of the state of play last minute and things like that. But um, yeah, I mean, you can uh, enjoy, enjoy your pal world on PlayStation finally. All right, let's move on to some recent developments for Concord, where this news is a little bit old now at this point because it came out right after LTPS last week, and I think we might hear something fairly soon, so hopefully this conversation is not going to be immediately outdated. But we still have to cover this rumor that popped up, uh, which gave us some insight into maybe what really went on with this game. So this comes from Colin Moriarty of Last Stand Media and the Sacred Symbols podcast, where he was approached by a single source, and that's very important here. It was a single source, but it was somebody who worked on Concord, and uh, they talked a lot about the game. Colin verified this person, they that they were who they said they were, and uh, we are apparently hearing more about how this game was made and how it came to be. But again, bear in mind, it's a single source, so still a rumor. The big headline here is the game cost allegedly around $400 million to make. The first quarter of 2023 was when the game was in an alpha state and it was already around $200 million spent, but that would have been an unknown split between probably Monsters and Sony and other sort of uh, initial investors and founders uh, before they acquired the studio. So that's not a full $200 million that Sony spent, but to get it over the finish line in 18 months or so, that's when another $200 million was spent from Sony, not including acquisition costs. And apparently the game was in a very laughable state early on. Sony spent a lot of cash to get it to a sort of minimum viable state and that a lot of the spending was done on outsourcing. 
Internally, the game was uh, championed. It was apparently Herman Hulse's baby, considered the future of PlayStation, almost like a, a very big Star Wars-esque project. And uh, as for how the game was made, there was apparently a very toxic positivity vibe in that you could not say anything negative about the game, no criticisms, no feedback loop. Uh, Ethan Gatch of Kotaku could not verify the budget numbers, but they did chime in and say they've heard the same in terms of you know the, the toxic po positivity thing and that's something that um, you know we have at least one other person vouching for that info we do have a, a few others that have kind of been more outspoken about the budget number and how it sounds incredibly high Colin himself thought the game did not or was not even close to that that sort of budget amount uh, he thought it was like what gonna be like a hundred million like low hundred million somewhere around there you know, I always thought it was like definitely a hundred million plus dollars, but I always refrain from giving the stuff a number because, well, in, in this case where if it's true, like that's why, like you never know exactly how these things are going to pan out in terms of just how much money these, these things can cost. Labor is very expensive. They are in Washington. So there is that to consider. It's still a lot of people. I know some like to sort of get into the semantics of, yeah, but it was only 150 up until recently and this, that, and the fourth. And, but then you include outsourcing and the, the amount of people on the project then you you know benchmark it to other SIE titles where spider-man was you know also a ton of money 300 million something dollars but you you compare that to say part two where that was like 200 million something dollars so some some things don't add up so a lot of folks are like the budget thing really doesn't make a whole lot of sense um honestly i find the budget number is really not all that important because whether it was say a hundred two three four you know sony lost all of it because they're not making any money on this game outside of anything they can salvage from the project itself and the the resources the talent if they do decide to you know try and put it back out there again which we still don't know exactly what they're planning on doing with this game but i will say some of this stuff does add up in that yeah herman holst he played the game uh early on back in like 2018 or something like that that was a, a, a play a play session he did excuse me um so he was always from from the very onset a big proponent of the game that was public info at that point so as far as his leadership and when he became the head of ps studios this is one of those projects where we can absolutely attribute it to him from the very start to the very end because i always like to throw this caveat in here which is when it comes to playstation leadership and how long games take to make you know oftentimes we can't necessarily attribute it to like oh it's so and so's fault when they got the job during a cycle where all the games were already like in production right you, you kind of have to wait for like a turnover of at least you know a handful of games to then see like oh that's where the decision making was for certain this guy so in this case this game was from herman holst the entire way through the funding and championing uh, championing the game and we see from like the the dual sense they did the playstation gear store the the amazon episode like yeah it sounds like they probably did really think this thing was going to be a big deal um what's more concerning is that the game was actually in like a really rough shape 18 months ago and they were able to not only get it out the door you know within those 18 months but like again it's a technically polished sound game which is a very surprising thing to see it come out the way that it did if anything that really speaks volumes to at least the talent for being able to put it out the way that it that it was but I'm also not sure how much stock we can really put into that when a lot of games, from what I've heard with AAA studios, they always look really rough, like let's say 18 months out from release. So it really depends on exactly how this was described to Colin, how he's relaying it, or what's you know the actual understanding of like what was considered bad and then actually bad. So I, that is also a little bit muddy. But really the, the concerning thing here, which is really the most believable, uh, believable portion, is perhaps this inherent lack of a, a feedback loop on the game because that's always been the most surprising thing about concord outside of like how yeah it's technically sound and it's it's actually not a bad game on paper it's more the matter of like well how did it pass through so many you know focus groups or, or mock reviews or you know how did somebody not step forward look at this game and go maybe we should reconsider certain design elements or maybe we should take a look at this or that i mean I think there's so much more that needs to be uncovered here, so I'm not even going to really speculate much further on that outside of, I mean, that's, I think what we were all expecting and we're all wondering, how did that happen, especially when with SIE being involved with these games, they do tend to be, you know, hands off in the case of like, let the studio be creative and do their own thing and, and not necessarily have too much, um, say and as far as like the overall direction of the game goes 
but uh, I, I think there's just so much more that we need to figure out about why the game turned out the way that it did because uh, I mean yeah I, th that's the part that's believable that and also that Sony genuinely thought like oh we've got something here and it's going to be a very big deal they could not have been more off the mark on that clearly Moving on to some PS5 Pro enhancement details for a number of games, because again, as Sony has said, they're expecting between 40 to 50 games that will have a PS5 Pro enhancement on day one, and we're now getting more insight into the kind of titles and also what we're expecting on those games. So over on the PS blog, Sony has collected a number of you know blurbs and excerpts from uh, the developers that are working on this console. And so it's at their discretion on what they want to describe and confirm in the here and now. So here's a basic summary of all the games and what we should be expecting for those enhancements. Uh, Gran Turismo 7, Polyphony Digital, that's going to be 4K PSSR with RT reflections or an experimental 8K 60fps mode. Horizon Forbidden West and Zero Dawn Remastered from Guerrilla Games is going to have a 60fps mode with quality mode visuals or better. The Last of Us Part 1 and Part 2 Remastered from Naughty Dog is going to be 1440p upscaled to 4K with PSSR targeting 60 frames per second and there will also be higher frame rate modes available as well. Spider-Man Remastered, Miles Morales, Spider-Man 2, and Rift Apart from Insomniac Games. That's going to have a new default performance pro mode, and it's going to also offer a 4K fidelity mode with RT at 60 FPS. Hogwarts Legacy from Avalanche. There's going to be a 30 FPS mode with enhanced RT reflections and shadows, and a 60 FPS mode with richer graphics and higher resolution uh, using PSSR. Resident Evil Village and Resident Evil 4 and Dragon's Dogma 2 from Capcom. Dragon's Dogma will use PSSR, new RT features, and also improve frame rates. RE Village is getting a 120 frames per second mode, and RE4 is also getting higher frame rates. And that's all they're saying, so again, this is their discretion on what they want to confirm. They did not say 120 mode for RE4, only RE Village, so that's what they're saying for that. Uh, moving on to Jedi Survivor, Dragon Age the Valguard from EA. Uh, for Dragon Age, there's going to be improved resolutions in both 30 FPS fidelity and 60 FPS performance modes uh, using PSSR, ray traced ambient occlusion in the performance mode. Jedi Survivor will have 2160p in quality mode, and performance will have PSSR, RT reflections, and ambient occlusion. Rise of the Ronin from Koei Tecmo, higher frame rate, and that's literally all they're saying. So. Again, their discretion, that's all they wanted to say. Uh, same for Metal Gear Solid Delta from Konami, using PSSR, higher frame rates, that's it. The first Descendant from Nexon, more natural lighting and shadow effects using PSSR and enabling FSR 3.1 frame generation for improving frame rate. Alan Wake 2 from Remedy, ray tracing is being added to the game, improving visuals and effects in the 60 FPS mode, and upping the output resolution to 4K. Big caveat, the output resolution, so going back to last week's LTPS, uh, obviously it's more about the quality of the resolution and not necessarily the actual resolution itself. Uh, moving on to Stellar Blade from Shift Up, 4K at 50 FPS or more using PSSR in the upscale mode or a high frame rate mode for an 80 FPS experience in the 120 hertz container if you have a 120 display. So, you know, we're seeing this, this really run the gamut here on what studios are doing with PSSR and, and with PS5 Pro, and also, again, what they're willing to describe on this blog post. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth from Square Enix, a new enhanced mode specifically for PS5 Pro, runs at 60 FPS with PSSR to achieve a similar resolution to graphics mode. The Crew, Motorfest, and Assassin's Creed Shadows from Ubisoft. The Crew is getting 60 FPS with improved graphics, more objects on screen, decals, vegetation, crowds, uh, AC shadows will have RT global illumination and use PSSR, increasing the photorealism of the game. Uh, there was also a listing for the console on PlayStation.com that confirms more enhanced games, that being Warframe, Callisto Protocol, No Man's Sky, and Lies of P. And there's a few other games that have been confirmed just from separate studios themselves, so we're already getting a good idea of exactly, you know, what is of those 40 to 50 games that is, like, for sure going to be there day one, and likely, depending on what shows up last minute in terms of the submission process for the patch and things like that, um, we might end up having maybe more 
more than 50. There is uh, a few places now that are like keeping a running list of the amount of games and the, the enhancements. There's one on Reset Era that I'll link down below if you want to start following that. Um, I believe it's also on Reddit as well, so I'll leave uh, both links down there for you to keep up to date on what's going on with that. But uh, so far, it does seem like we are seeing a number of examples and use cases. Uh, a lot of PSSR, which is good. I mean, that is something where PSSR, you want to see that widely adopted, not just from first party, but also third party as well. You know, it is an AI model that's going to get better over time with different iterations. And so even if you're looking at PS5 Pro right now and saying it's not worth it, the enhancements aren't there and not at that price tag, well, that's totally fine, obviously, because this could be a very important foundation for PlayStation 6. That and also, it's interesting seeing, at least on PS5 Pro, some studios are doing like one mode and some are saying, no, no, there is going to be a pro mode, but we'll still offer like the standard fidelity and performance mode. And that's where you can see greater gains depending on what you want, right? Like a higher base resolution uh, or just a, a much higher frame rate mode. We really are seeing a number of different use cases and Ideally, that's good. You don't want it to be a one-size-fits-all necessarily, and you certainly don't want that in the, the case of you know how games are just so different in terms of budget and scope and you know what exactly the game is doing or what it's trying to be. Uh, but we can segue nicely into our next story here, which is that Sony did have a hands-on event at their San Mateo headquarters where they flew in a number of publications to get hands-on time with the console. Uh, it sounds like they only got to play like three hours or so, a very short window, but at least as far as this conversation goes, the one publication we want to look at is Digital Foundry for how they like to really get in there and hyper-analyze these games and uh, try to have a more thorough conversation. So Oliver McKenzie was the one that had some hands-on time. They already did a, you know, like an hour-long conversation on their channel, which I will, of course, link down below, but we'll try and quickly summarize some of the key points that came out of that conversation. So at least for Oliver, he did say that F124, um, that game has an 8K mode and also a 4K120 mode, and he was very surprised by how good that game looks and certainly with uh, RT now baked into that game as well because it really dramatically changes how it looks and we do also now have a second game with an 8k mode very surprising but we do have that um we also found out that Horizon Forbidden West is not using PSSR or checkerboard rendering. Uh, and then the Crew Motorfest apparently looks much, much cleaner. Uh, he also mentioned that Demon Souls is more, ex more an example of a game that already looks really good on the base console. And so on the Pro, it's really just resolving uh, a slightly cleaner 4K image uh, on the, the new mode, I should say. And then Dragon's Dogma 2 is more of an atypical example of PS5 Pro support. They are using PSSR and the frame rate is a lot Lot more stable as in it's in the 50s now when running through the city so it's now in that VRR window where a compatible display could potentially clean it up so uh, the kind of game that you know if it's a little bit problematic on the existing console you might be in a better spot on this machine as well Oliver also as far as like his basic summary and like his closing thoughts he does say that if you're you know the kind of person where if you value fidelity if you like ray tracing higher frame rates and performance modes then yes PS5 Pro is a good investment but that's relative to pc prices what you could get on pc and it's like under the context of you're a console buyer as and you like what a console offers you you pay one price it's a plug and play box has that highly optimized ui and everything that we've already gone uh, gone over before but um those are kind of his, uh, his closing thoughts on the, the entire thing which yeah i mean it, it sounds like the console does have some some decent performance, right? Not even decent. It sounds like some games are seeing a pretty dramatic improvement. If it does speak to you on that level of more of an enthusiast that wants the very best out of your games and you're willing to foot that bill. I will say for PlayStation 5 Pro and what it's able to do in the here and now, I really want to see the outcome it might have for the PS4 titles. Because that still in theory is what they're saying is that PSSR could be potentially applied to the existing library of PS4 games to where that might clean up 1080p games that were prior to PS4 Pro support. You know, if that really is there, I mean, that's what we're hearing. I'd like to see that as well, because I think there's a lot of use cases for where there's like some serious upside to using the console in that manner. Um, because like what doesn't sit well with me, and I, I think this is a, a valid criticism, is that 
you don't necessarily want the Pro to be an answer to games that are problematic on the base console when, in theory, the studio itself should be making sure that that game is optimized on the base console. Like, if you if you can't hit 60 on the base console, I mean, that's that's one thing, but then make sure you're, you're offering a capped 30 FPS mode that's a lot more stable. You want to make sure that there's still... The, the modes you're offering on the base machine are not compromised in any fashion and you're not putting the consumer in a spot where they feel they need to buy a pro in order to play the game at a comfortable level that is you know acceptable right so certain studios are going to have to walk that line and make sure that they're still taking care of the base console which in theory should not really be a problem for the entirety of this life cycle Moving on to the recent release of God War Ragnarok on PC, where so far the game has done reasonably well, uh, about 35000 for a peak CCU over the weekend, which is uh, pretty good compared to most other PS Studio games now that we've seen them really kind of, you know, have these launches that were like completely underwhelming to some that did incredibly well. Some of those titles early on being the 2018 game because it was still a very new novel thing to have PS Studio games shipping on PC. So 35000 is not really a bad number. That does indicate the game probably sold in the neighborhood of a few hundred thousand copies. Um, but but really the news here is that the game is reviewing kind of in the mixed area because the PSN requirement is now here for what is a single player game not needed of course so the PC audience still not exactly happy about that there's even a mod that came out that removes the PSN login and the PlayStation overlay menu and uh, that's of course how the PC audience is going to you know reconcile with us they're gonna step in use mods and do what they do and you know i'll say what i've said before i think when it comes to single player games you want this was always an opportunity to get on their good side the the pc audience this is just free money the company left on the table for a long time i, I don't want to repeat the same points i always do about this but like console and pc buyers are actually pretty different so it's like you're never really going to sell a console to these guys so you might as well just ship the game there after a one you one two year delay and just take home that that free cash but it's like make sure you start shipping stable solid pc builds go against the grain of what all these other third-party publishers have a bad reputation of and you know make sure these games are good solid don't require psn for single player games like just don't aggravate them and you're you're just going to be on their good side you're going to have this goodwill and be in these um good graces of uh these buyers that are willing to in droves come out and and buy your games right but it's like you're kind of kind of throwing that out the door here so sony's just you know and i get it from their point of view because it's like whatever we'll just eat the uh bad publicity rip off that band-aid and at a certain point i'm sure it will fizzle out but the thing is like you don't want that to be the outcome here like it's it should not be required it's like that on console assuming you buy discs then yes the console can be played offline you don't have to make a psn id it should be like that on pc for single player games just because other third-party publishers do it does not mean Sony should also just get away with us. They had an opportunity here to be on the good side of a lot of buyers, and I think that was the wrong idea. We're certainly we're certainly not going to advocate for Sony to be, you know, doing data collection and all these things that are just going to upset people that are also just as much a consumer as somebody on console would be. So, uh, yeah, they've they've kind of just ripped the bandaid off, and that's kind of what they're they're going to just deal with it for now, and it probably will at a certain point fizzle out, but. Uh, the mods, I think, are going to be a very commonplace thing to remove that requirement. Next up, this is more of a reminder, but we are right in the middle of TGS, and this is something where, for the first time in many years, Sony is there right now exhibiting. They've got a, a pretty big show floor from what I'm seeing. Uh, they've got a lot of Astrobots set up. Uh, they've actually got this like crazy huge gotcha machine, which looks amazing. Um, there's a lot of pictures being shared by Shuhei and the PS blog and people on the ground floor. We also saw Ken Kutaragi, the father of PlayStation, uh, giving his little initial keynote for the show when it kicked off. We can see Ken finally getting some of those gray hairs. The man is obviously way up there in age, but he's always been quite a stud for, you know, what is a Japanese man? They, they age so gracefully. And uh, the father there is finally getting some white hairs. I see you, Ken. And uh, as a reminder, we also have the Death Stranding 2 panel that is happening on Sunday as well. So we have no clue exactly what that's going to entail, but probably some cool stuff coming out of that, uh, which will be on Sunday. So there is some TGS news that we can probably expect throughout the weekend. And uh, when the dust settles, we'll talk about anything that we missed for the following LTPS. 
Moving on to some PS Productions news for The Last of Us HBO Season 2, they did indeed put out a new full-length trailer for The Last of Us Day, which was again yesterday, so uh, we saw a lot more of Season 2 and very exciting stuff. Uh, it is confirmed that Joel was confiding with Catherine O'Hara, so not exactly sure what's going on there, but... We now have some insight into that. We saw a lot of big scenes from part two, all, you know, quick jump cuts and everything. Some of those scenes are definitely out of order, at least with what you saw in the game, because we know season two is not going to be the entirety of uh, the part two game, but we're seeing some scenes that should very much be in that back half showing up in season two. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's very exciting. I, I watched that and I just got the feels. I'm like, oh man, these big moments. It's so cool seeing them in person again. It's like really realistic watching season one because it was so man, it was just so fun watching season one and having like it it was it was just i'm at a loss for words here it was just so encouraging to see like the big moments happen in the show and they treated the source material so well and knowing that we are going to likely see that again for season two it's just uh man i i can't wait they're still only saying 2025 um, so they don't have like a date or even a, a month or anything like that, but, uh, well, the year's almost over. It's moving pretty damn fast, so we won't have to wait too much longer to see more of season two. Now, with all that said, it is time for Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or X. And this week, we actually have a different giveaway, courtesy of Antstream Arcade, where they recently launched on PS4, PS5. It's their retro game streaming service where they offer like 1,300-something retro games on there uh, across various platforms. There's mini games on there and things like that. So they're providing LTPS viewers with five 12-month North American codes. So if you would like to win, then follow the link down below, enter the Gleam giveaway, and we'll announce the winners next week because we are trying to help you play some retro games. Those are some of the stories from this past week that I wanted to talk about with you all. And Tuesday we had the state of play, like full reactions, impressions. So you can go watch that if you want to get caught up on every single announcement from the state of play and how I felt at the time. And then coming up, I think we'll just have a standard Tuesday upload. Not sure if we'll have anything up on Sunday, but um, there's a few conversation topics that I might want to explore. So not sure what we're doing there. Uh, we also have another Click R3 episode coming out very soon as well with a guest, so you might want to stay tuned for that as well. Uh, but otherwise, that is pretty much it. So that concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Panaki. Thank you all so much for talking with me, and I will see you all next Friday.